Inshallah, you can hear us fine. Then I'll read the last two paragraphs, inshallah. And we will try to uh, summarize everything we've read up until now. So the 24th word, the end of the second branch. Thus, in this comparison, which is mixed with reality, perfection is reached by means of three ways, which are all different, and which differ concerning the virtues of those perfections and the details of the degrees of witnessing. But in conclusion and in submitting to the truth and confirming the reality, they are in agreement. Just as a man of the night who has never seen the sun and has only seen its shadow in the mirror of the moon cannot squeeze into his mind the resplendent light and awesome gravity particular to the sun, but submits to those who have seen it and imitates them. Similarly, one who cannot attain to the maximum degrees of names like all-powerful and giver of life through the legacy of Muhammad, peace be upon him, accepts the resurrection of the dead and great, great gathering imitati, imitati, imitatively and declares it is not a matter that can be understood through the reason. For the reality of the resurrection and last judgment is the manifestation of the greatest name and of the supreme degree of certain other names. Those whose gaze cannot rise there are compelled to believe it by way of imitation, while those whose minds can enter there see the resurrection and last judgment as easily as day and night and spring and winter and accept it with an easy mind. Thus, it is due to this mystery that the Quran speaks of the resurrection and great gathering at the highest level and in the most perfect detailed manner. And our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, who manifested the greatest name, taught it thus. And as required by the wisdom of guidance, the former prophets did not teach their communities, which were at a somewhat simple and primitive level, about the resurrection of the dead at the highest level and with the most extensive details. It is also due to this mystery that some of those who follow the path of sainthood did not see or could not demonstrate some of the truths of belief at the greatest degree. It is also due to this mystery that there are pronounced differences in the degrees of those who have knowledge of God. Numerous other mysteries like these unfold from this truth. Now, since both this comparison hints at the truth a little, and the truth is extremely extensive and profound, we also shall content ourselves with the comparison and not attempt mysteries which are beyond our limit and capacity. I think finally he answers the questions that, were, that was asked in the beginning of this branch. Right? There were some questions like, uh, why are there so many different paths or why do some saints fall astray or like latch on to one, only like one truth and not the others? And it seems here, uh, he gives an answer in the second paragraph. He says that, well, he, I mean, his first example, he gives us the resurrection. He says something like a resurrection. To be able to understand it, you need to be able to, uh, if there's, you need to, it, it says that uh, the resurrection and the last judgment is a manifestation of the greatest name and of the supreme degree of certain other names. And those whose gaze cannot rise there are compelled to believe it by way of imitation. So I'm thinking this is like an example he's giving of something that not everyone can truly comprehend. And some people maybe imitate, imitatively believe it. And because everyone has different degrees of belief and different degrees of understanding, uh, people fall into different paths. Like it was asking in the beginning. Like one of the questions I'm looking at is like, like the second mystery was like, why did the early prophets leave some of the pillars of belief like bodily resurrection in brief form and not explain them in detail like the Quran? I mean, these are some questions he was asking in the beginning. Or why did the saints differ great, greatly in their visions and illuminations, although they are unanimous on the principles of belief? And the conclusion is that belief is a very uh, deep thing, has like various ways of like manifesting itself. You know, you can be a, you can be the flower, the droplet, the atom, 
You can be all three of them at once. Um, and yeah, I think he gave like a kind of like an answer in a subtle way too. And then he says something here which caught my attention. He says, and as required by the wisdom of guidance, the former prophets did not teach their communities, which were at a somewhat simple and primitive level, about the resurrection of the dead at the highest level and with the most extensive details. So technologically, maybe we could say we're at a more advanced level. But I don't think that... He's talking about them technologically. And generally, when we think about uh, us being primitive, we all say, like, in terms of belief, like, we all start from the same point, and we're all primitive. So I'm not sure. I mean, these are just my questions I'm asking. Because uh, that's all I know how to do. I ask questions and then listen to your answers. Uh, that's one question. Uh, I, okay, and then since I have no comments so far, then I'll just start from the beginning. And, uh, we read the end of the second branch before the third branch. Yeah, the last two paragraphs. Inshallah, I'll just uh, start again and then try to go maybe sentence by sentence or a few sentences by sentences. So it's thus in this comparison, which is mixed with reality. That's also interesting because he's saying it's mixed with reality. Is that saying that some of it is not real reality, or is all of it reality? No, I guess he just means like this is just a comparison. Only has partially like a comparison can be partially okay. true. Uh, Parts of it are true. So yes, this is just a comparison. Don't get lost in details, okay. or don't expect that you will understand everything about reality through a simple comparison. Perfection is reached by means of three ways which are all different and which differ concerning the virtues of those perfections and the details of the degrees of witnessing. So apparently we can reach perfection in three ways and they're all different. So I guess that means that even though the atom is seemingly the ideal state we try to aim for, the other states can still somehow get to perfection. Uh, their perfection. So, but their perfection, if it's a perfection, then... So below, he gives some examples about the moon, seeing the sun. If you are living in the night time, he says, only like a, for your perfection is believing that there's a sun. This is your perfection. Okay. But if you are able to live in the day time, your perfection is looking at the sun, which is, you know, uh, having a, a, let's say, more direct access to sun compared to the first time. Okay. And details of degrees of witness. Okay. But in conclusion, and in submitting to the truth and confirming the reality, they are in agreement. Are they in, okay? In conclusion, and in submitting to the truth and confirming the reality, they're in agreement. They're in agreement in believing that there is a creator or there is a source. Is that what it's saying? They are in agreement that there must be a sun. So their conclusion is the same. The sun okay. must exist, but the first two are indirect. The third one is directly a right to this. Just as a man of the night who has never seen the sun and has only seen a shadow in the mirror of the moon cannot squeeze into his mind the resplendent light and awesome gravity particular to the sun, but some to those who have seen it imitates them. Similarly, one who cannot attain to the maximum degrees of names like all-powerful and giver of life through the legacy of Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, accepts the resurrection of the dead in great gathering imita imitatively and declares it is not a matter that can be understood through the reason. So this matter of resurrection is like the sun, and those that cannot look at the sun or 
but perceive, let's say, the moon and its reflection, or perceive like a flower. Uh, those that cannot see the sun, but see the flower or see the moon, would be imitatively believing in resurrection. So there's different degrees of witnessing or believing in resurrection or these matters. For the reality of the resurrection and last judgment is the manifestation of the greatest name and of the supreme degree of certain other names. So there was an uh, interesting anecdote. He said, We cannot attain the maximum degrees of names like all four of them, give of life, through the legacy of the peace and blessings. So, what is the legacy of Prophet that through his legacy we can understand the greatest degrees, maximum degrees of all powerful and giver of life? That uh, without this legacy, without following this path, whatever that path is, going with an alternative path, which was in the case of Prophet, uh, he, he was climbing the Letters of philosophy in this case, for instance, so you cannot uh, reach to this maximum level. Therefore, you will have to accept resurrection imitatively. We can talk about what is that legacy. Uh, well, legacy I generally understand is what you leave behind. So the prophet left behind things. Uh, for me, that would be his one, his message, and then his students, his family. So I think in general, uh, the question is, where am I trying to find my answers? Am I trying to find answers uh, in the first case, just within myself, at whatever level? We can, I don't know, we can recap what was the first flower was we. The second one was also getting some information from outside, looking for some philosophers and uh, benefiting from their ideas, enlightening ideas. And Rusha says it enlightens them. It's not that they leave you in darkness. But uh, of course, these are categorizations. So is, it, there, is there no philosopher which is not the follower of messenger? Not to get into this much of things at the end, this is just a metaphor. But uh, there is also a third category, as if now he's explaining, uh, the legacy of messengers. So where am I looking for answers in general? So if I stumble upon some questions in life, some deep existential questions, let's put it this way, such as where am I going to? What happens after death? Or is there any after death? What happened to the past moments? These sort of questions. So uh, would I like to go ahead and ask to like some Western philosophers, they sound cooler, or do I go and ask to uh, some Muslim philosophers? Do I go and ask to Imam in the mosque? So to whom do I ask questions? So do I have a portrait of whom shall I ask those questions? Or shall I just sit in front of Quran by myself and try to understand it? So I guess, uh, in principle, in my mind, who is the proper addressee of my questions? To whom shall I ask those questions? Because apparently this choice is putting me into one of these three categories. Whose word is valuable in my eyes? From there, I am in expectation of finding answers. Because if I am convinced that it's going to come from here, then I will invest my time trying to find answers in that particular path. If it's another way, I will uh, give time into that. So, for like the flower and the droplet, when they search for answers, it's not it's not pure in that they're not seeking like a pure revelation, like something like that. It's more they somehow see uh, or seek help from themselves, maybe, or they also see that 
Like, how is the atom seeking differently than the flower in the droplet? Um, I don't know. Like, it's I think the way that he is also missing first branch, second branch, third branch, because in the third branch he is going to start talking about narrations. Uh, it also tells me, like, the way that he is uh, just listing the right steps. Uh, if you ask to me, Western philosophers sound cooler. Like, they, they are using heavier words or uh, in the job, in the work, when I go there, it's cooler to sell. Even within Muslim circles, uh, quoting a uh, Western philosopher works much, much better than quoting a Muslim scholar or quoting a hadith. If you quote hadith, you're going to be wooed. But if you quote, I don't know, Kant, Hegel, I, I don't know their names, it's going to sound cooler who this guy read something. In myself, I am feeling, this is again too much of a speaking the truth from within myself, I feel like uh, maybe they found something better. Maybe this is what I shall first go and check. And also, it's not only that, I mean, these are the guys that made this huge civilization. Look at the miserable Muslims, what, what did they find? If what they were saying truth, then it would benefit themselves. Look at them. And look at the Westerners. So this might be one way of taking it, but of course it's not only Western philosophers. There is also I don't know, Muslim philosophers back in the day. Uh, the game was just the opposite. But still, uh, they will be asking for answers, like in the time of Avicenna, Ibn Sina. For him also, which was cooler? Studying Greek philosophy was cooler, or going to the uh, Quranic sources or sources that is going back to the messenger, which was more appealing. So I guess which one is more appealing to me? And the appealing in the sense that where do I expect to find the answers? To me, these two are the same question. Being appealing and also where do I expect to find the answer? If I expect to find the answer more in uh, philosophy, then I will go with it. Is it, there is a philosophical objection. No, there. no, no, there's no objection. I was just thinking that, um, you know, philosophy is a very loaded term. It has a lot of different connotations. And at least one of the connotations that I work with primarily is it's as a tool rather than as a particular uh, worldview or thought. And tool as in just um, method of analysis, not necessarily even about a source uh, or a text, but really just a way of approaching a certain problem. Uh, and so in, in that respect, I don't think it should be as easily juxtaposed with going to Quranic sources or you know to the prophet or trying to understand him because you know there can be a synthesis of that in terms of whatever you're saying just a close analysis a, close, a different tool to help you also unravel or extract meaning from these um you know either from what what i think is, is the speech of my creator to me or for, from the example of a human being who exemplifies that speech so I just wanted to put there because, you know, I think it, we, we, we're at a danger of further perpetuating certain misconceptions when they get sort of mutually exclusive of to what do I look at, even though I agree with the points that you share and the sentiments and um, I don't disagree with them, I, I share them myself in my own state of being, but I think we should also put that in terms of treating it, what kind of discipline we're treating it. Does this mean that like Quranic approach doesn't have, or does it imply that the Quranic approach doesn't have uh, a methodology? No, it doesn't imply that it doesn't have a methodology, but it also shouldn't imply that looking at something philosophically is it's mutually exclusive with applying and trying to understand something through that Quranic methodology.
I think we need to go about in broadening our understanding of what it means to study something philosophically. In, in my, I would argue that to study something philosophically is pretty much in alignment with utilizing Quranic methodology. But I mean, that's a cider note, a side note to the doctor. So here he says, as Brother Yusuf was saying, one who cannot attain to the maximum degrees of names like all powerful and giver of life through the legacy of Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, accepts the resurrection of the dead and great gathering imit imitatively. And I'm just trying to understand what this means. Like, what it, does it mean to attain to the maximum degrees of names like all, all powerful and giver of life? Like initially, I'd say attaining to the maximum degree of these names is just being able to see all these names are manifesting around you. And just seeing that there's a door behind these names, and maybe uh, seeing that it's continuously manifesting as such. Uh, and that you don't like see anything within creation as having this name by itself. Like you don't see any small name in creation. Like there's a beauty, like this has a small amount of power. And there's a big amount of power. You just see that there is one name of powerful or one name of giver of life. Uh, yes, Sir Hill, please go ahead. Um, yeah, some, along what you were saying, uh, you know, to see, for example, the name he gives of all power and, full and giver of life at the maximum degree is if you were to see them potentially to the maximum degree, you would see the resurrection and the great gathering, obviously. It would be so obvious that there could be no um, sort of doubt uh, or hesitation uh, in your mind. It would be, as you said, so obvious because one who creates the universe must be all powerful and one <clears throat> you know witnessing to life here the one who does so must be the giver of life and if you see that as being so obvious without any sort of uh, intermediary um that what is happening on, on is on his account only then the resurrection and great gathering as he says becomes very easy to not only sort of reason through but to see it happening like right now the resurrection of the universe as it's happening right now or the recreation of the universe in every moment and the great gathering that's happening in every moment with the new creation of the universe so something that a recreation and gate gathering that is different in this universe, a different sort of existence is not difficult to understand. It's obvious. But if you think things here have power or things here have a life onto their own, I'm not saying people, you, you, you say it, but you're not com completely aware at, uh, in being an atom. Maybe you're a flower or a droplet. So you're not completely aware. So you just kind of go about your life thinking things have some sort of powerful effect on their own or that their life occurs. There's something maybe intrinsic to creation as a life unto its own. Like that's how you sort of maybe go about yourself in, in this world. I mean, just day to day life. Then to except the resurrection and gate great gathering, it may not be completely comprehensible. You don't deny it necessarily, but you're not completely certain either. So you accept it imitatively because it sounds right. Really, can there be anything else? Um, and then you kind of go about your life. So I think that's kind of what he's alluding to here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that makes it more clear.
I think that makes sense too. Essentially finding the creator. And then through these names, which means uh, the maximum degree of these names. But he says like something very, uh, very strong. He says that we're imitatively believing. And I don't think I could say that I have in any way found the greatest manifestation of these names. It's probably something you spend your whole life trying to do. But I guess I'll continue. I think just to decide that. I think it can also be understood as an attitude, right? Like you can try to understand the maximum degree of the names, like all power from giver by utilizing, uh, you know, the prophet as a teacher and as a source of guidance. Or, you know, he says, the one that does this imitatively declares it, it's not a matter that can be understood for the reason. Or you can just say, well, you know, this is not accessible to me anyway. Or you can at least be on the path and try to utilize the source that you have. Yeah. Is that a new answer though? Uh, yeah, I wanted to say one quick thing. So I think as an individual, people can go back and forth. For example, let's say in my life that, you know, one moment, you know, I'm certain if he gives the example of the resurrection. So I'm certain of the resurrection because of what I see before me. So I'm sort of present or aware of what's happening right now. Maybe like for a few minutes, a few moments occasionally during the day. The rest of the time, maybe I'm not. So in a way, you know, uh, th this is just the way I look at it. In those other sort of moments, I maybe become more sort of, sort of like a one who imitates because to imitate is not really to think things through or to be reflective or to be um, analytical um, and sort of aware of how you th what you're thinking and what you're feeling about what's happening right in front of you. you if you're not doing that, you're just kind of going with the flow. Um, and living in the moment but without really sort of stepping back and thinking about what's actually happening right now. In that way, that's sort of a more of an imitative perspective. So it's not like somebody is to me one way or the other, but it's how cognizant one is of trying to be like the atom rather than trying to be like the droplet or the flower you know, how that is the legacy of Muhammad or legacy of prophecy is sort of this, you know, consciousness or all encompassing consciousness uh, of his life. So that that's so <clears throat> something else I wanted to add. Thank you. The books like uh, imitation, especially in circles, circles like ours, they sound, directly sound negative. Oh, he's just saying, you know, uh, there are some people who cannot uh, attain uh, perfection as some other people, so they only imitate as a derogatory way, right? I just imitate. I get such an understanding. Yes, he is talking about some different degrees. That is true. Uh, but he's not insulting people at different degrees. It's not saying that uh, if you cannot see the sun, boo to you. You are doomed. You can just imitate. He says imitation is another level of living it, understanding it. So I guess it's such understanding, such interpretation of words like imitation in a negative way, probably stems from uh, the assumption that we can live happily uh, without the notion of resurrection or without whatever we are imitating. 
let us assume worshiping or praying. So as if I can live contently as a human without praying. So if I'm not seeing the sun at this moment, I shouldn't pray, wait for the right moment. Or uh, if I cannot see as I see the flower in front of me, or I see you, if I cannot see resurrection, reality of the resurrection, it's better not to think about it. Wait, one day you will understand, and you will uh, find your reality without imitating. So as if I can do that. So one example, for instance, comes to my mind to show that, that I cannot do that. It's not healthy for me. Sometimes, you know, something happens, something bad happens, say, or something, not necessarily bad, something that we cannot explain. Or sometimes you need to do something that you are very scared but your friend, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your friend says, don't worry, just do it, trust me. So, I don't know, like, you're trying to give a, a medicine to a child, but the child cannot see the benefit of the medicine. He cannot. If you ask him, he wouldn't take it. So he doesn't see it, right? But you tell him, tell her that, trust me, it will help you. And he imitates, child imitates, and take the medicine right, and becomes healthier. Or you go somewhere which is scary, your wife says, oh, I'm scared, you know, we shouldn't go there. I say, don't worry, just trust me, I know what is there. I see it. So it's good for us to go there. And she imitates me. So in her reality, in her mind, she doesn't see it as I see. She never experienced it, but imitates me. Go there with me. Or you see something very nice in a character, a nice character in somebody. You don't see where it comes from. You don't see, you know, how he has it, whatever. But you imitate him because it's good for you. So I guess the same way, like imitating resurrection, the way I understand is imitatively believing in resurrection. The way I understand is looking at the people who somehow contently live with this understanding of the resurrection and you trust them through their action, through their sayings, through their behavior and you imitate them because you need it. You cannot live without it. It's because not having an ident understanding of a resurrection will destroy your life. So you cannot just say, you know, I don't see it, I'm not sure, so I will stay neutral because imitation is bad. But it doesn't work that way. When you learn something, you first imitate it. This is how we learn. And then see the benefit, which takes you closer to whatever you are supposed to see. So I guess the way he talks about imitation, it's not like uh, you are stupid, you are just uh, a layman, there's nothing more that you can just imitate. Or you know, if you are an educated person and if you don't see it, you shouldn't imitate it, it's just an insult to your mind. We usually use such phrases. It's insult to my 
humanity, it's insult to my mind, it's insult, whatever. As if living without it is not killing your humanity or is not killing your mind. Uh, MB and HP, uh, give a comment. Assalamu Um, I wanted to say, um, thank you for your comments. Um, as far as I understand, uh, the way that the shadow or the way that imitation is being presented here. It's not, um, as Berkhan was alluding, being rendered empty of all um, meaning in a way. Um, there seems to be some level of truth um, in the uh, in this imitation as well. Um, and I'm gonna make a couple of points, but one point point was um like the human being being both a man of the night and the day so i think like tying it into the point that uh suhail was making earlier like i at certain moments i might experience the direct sunlight of the day um and most of the time i find myself wandering within the shadows of the night um, but even within the, the darkness of the night, um, the text says, just as a man of the night who has never seen the sun and has only seen its shadow in the mirror of the moon. So there is still a reality to the situation that he experiences because he's seen the shadow in the mirror of the moon. So there is more veils um, between him and the sun in that particular uh, moment. But it is still somehow a very, very, you know, far connected manifestation of the sun in some sort. So it's not, um, it's not meaningless. It's not, it, it, it has some sort of substance, um, although it's a little bit hazy. And I was also thinking about like the, the, the feeling, the feelings that are in me when I think about resurrection, like without going through a logical process of concluding the necessity of um, resurrection or even without reflecting on um, being resurrected in the moment right now, here and now, um, by you know looking at a flower or whatever, even if I don't do that, if I just check solely with my human feelings, how do you feel about the idea of resurrection, about a hereafter? Um, and it says that's a pretty nice idea. Like I, I, I wouldn't, I would be down for that. But in and of itself, it's still insufficient, and um, it's necessary, but it's insufficient. Um, in so far as me feeling secure in that conviction because it's 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 not necessarily a conviction but there's still a level of truth in it because it still resonates it there is and the resonation there if that's a word is beyond my it's something that i've found within myself it's beyond my ability to choose to feel this way so there must be some sort of reality in it um but again it's insufficient in and of itself and then i had one last point this, this is maybe most disconnected point but i was thinking about what about like so here there's imitation and then also um those who uh can confirm the reality uh with certainty um and I, I, what about like um like or maybe this is just like maybe making a stretch that or a comparison that's too far out and shouldn't be it's being misplaced but like in prayer for example 
if, if I understand prayer as presenting my conclusions, I'm not necessarily, I don't know, or at least I don't think I am, like, you know, having certainty of something and so far as going through a reasoning process in my mind. It's more about just, hey, I came to this conclusion before and here I am presenting it and just kind of staying with the feeling or something like that. Um, so we're, we're like, I wouldn't call that necessarily imitation unless you call it imitation of your prior state. But um, I, that, that was just one other thing that may or may not necessarily be related that I was thinking about that I thought I'd share. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing those. I think the point that even if uh, your first point about how you have these human feelings and even if you haven't reasoned to that conclusion yourself, just the idea of resurrection or these different ideas, just the impact they have on your emotions, that also speaks volumes by itself. Like that also speaks to you and tells you something is correct here. Even though you need, it's not enough, even though uh, it needs to go further, but there is something there that's speaking to you. I think we need to be careful definition, uh, definition wise. I don't think there can be degrees of belief when talking about imitation. I mean, by, 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 definition, by definition, imitation cannot have the connotation of belief. There can be degrees, as, as he says, of witnessing and degrees of confirmation, and others may be at different degrees of confirmation that satisfy them, and others may be at different levels of confirmation that satisfy them. But imitation by, de by definition is not any degree of confirmation. It's just copy-pasting another person's answer. And I think, yes, there is truth in the, in the matter of the fact that, um, you know, even if I don't come to these sort of logical arguments, objections, etc., etc., about resurrection, if I look into my own qualities or my hopes um, and see that they accept resurrection, that too is a process of reasoning. That too is a form of confirmation that there must be some truth in the notion of resurrection. The fact that it aligns with my human expectations and my wants. So I just think, um, I, I understand the points that, that were made both by um, Brother Rupan and um, uh, H. Beza, but um, yeah, I, I think we should just be careful not to include within the notion of imitation belief. I mean, it's just. Well, like what well, Brother Rupan was saying, uh, is it like imitation like a necessary requirement to be able to get to belief? I, I think it, the, one of the points that he was making that I remember is that, you know, the alternative is something that can destroy someone, right? If they don't have any way of believing, sure. And this shouldn't mean that we should necessarily approach imitation in a negative light. And at the end of the day, I can only deal with my own thoughts and what's, anyways, I can't pass judgments or value judgments on other people or how they should be going about informing the world of their beliefs. But um, but I'm just saying that in terms of like words and definitions, belief is something that, regardless of how tiny it is, there is a state of witnessing and state of internal confirmation, and that's something that can't be encompassed by the notion of imitation. But this doesn't necessarily, again, to reiterate, this doesn't necessarily mean that it negates any of the value that some people might have in imitation or the value brings to their lives. I think um, just if you look at communities and um, the mass and majority of people or how they live their lives, I think imitation has a very important role in bringing value to people's lives. Sure, you can argue about it if you want to. Um, but I don't think we should... I, I, I would be careful not to say that there's a degree of confirmative aspect to it. I mean, those are mutual exclusive. Uh, there's a, do you want to go first? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, at the end of 10th verse, when he talks about resurrection, the example that he gives for imitatively accepting 
mindset for resurrection is Avicenna, Ibn Sina, the greatest of Muslim <coughs> philosophers. And his statement was, uh, resurrection is a matter of belief that comes to us through revelation, through narration. Mm -hmm. We have to accept it, uh, but the reason cannot find its way to this. This was his conclusion. So I guess in this context, when he talks about uh, imitation, it's not only that, well, this person is not able to articulate and uh, articulate in the sense that he, he doesn't have enough tools to, how, he doesn't know how to articulate. No, no, this guy truly knows how, how to articulate. But this person tried to find of how to articulate through his own means. I guess this is, this is the crux of the matter. So where am I going to learn how to reason when it comes to finding the divine names? Because the picture is so wide, as far as I understand, in the existence, things are so interdependent, so intricate, that human mind by itself is not able to see the big picture. I mean, this is sort of, this, is, this might sound like an assertion, but uh, this assertion also has a, a proof of it from another perspective, which I will come. But first, uh, as I'm reading from Nursi, it feels like he says, human cannot solve the riddle of this existence if left to his or her own senses alone. <laughs> then how is it going to happen? If human is shown the solution to this riddle, human can confirm this. The given tools are sufficient for that. So if you show the big picture and show, show it with balance, human is able to say that, yeah, it makes sense. But if I say that, no, I don't want to see the answer or I don't want you to tell me how to approach this answer. You already gave me the intellect and everything. I'm going to find my own way. This is what I understand from saying that I don't need revelation. I don't need uh, externally beyond this existence somebody to tell me how to think. And this is what I am, I mean, of course, reading from Nursi, not, uh, I, I don't read it in the scene uh, exclusively I mean, from outside of this text. But the way he presents it is, uh, if you try to take it by yourself only, you can go only that much. You cannot go to the maximum degree of names, meaning that you cannot see it, all its connections within, a, within measure. Within measure, meaning within a balance. This is why you cannot see the conclusion, and once you cannot go to conclusion, what are you going to do? You can conjecture. I mean, there are a lot of conjectures out there, they're not proven. You say that this sounds like this might be it. I'm not sure. And then you hear that a messenger comes or somebody comes and you feel like, it, you say, let's accept it. Because from my own way of thinking, I wouldn't call it accepting. Because if I cannot confirm something, let's say logically or this way, I wouldn't call it a confirmation, but there is no way I can confirm this, says it we see now that's in this example. But he says, well, as Brother Bikram was saying, I need to believe in this. I mean, it's, it's something essential for me. So how do I reason about this? Maybe that he can say, well, the messenger seems to be a, a trustworthy man, so still there is some sort of reasoning in there. So, and he says, so, so be it. Okay. In the normal sense of reasoning, this is not a reasoning of uh, resurrection. But uh, this is the best that he was able to do, because the way I understand the distinction between philosophy and the uh, what the legacy of messengerhood is, am I going to accept training from revelation? Meaning that my creator should teach me how to think, how to feel, how to reason. Or am I going to say that I already have those tools? God didn't tell me how to make a plane. I can make a plane by myself. Likewise, by myself, I can uh, learn how to, I don't know, prove resurrection, these sort of things. Because it feels like if I can, like, for example, Zainab, she can take the strawberry. She doesn't know about messenger yet, but she can put strawberry to her mouth without the uh, teaching of messenger, right? And we think that since this tiny thing is doable and possible, just putting it on top of everything, like this is just window block off proving anything. She can do something. She can put two blocks of knowledge on top of each other. 
and put something new. Therefore, extrapolating it, we can solve any riddle in this existence, we think. But author's positioning here is, he says, human is not able to get the whole picture in this existence because everything is so interdependent, intricate, that the names are manifesting absolutely everywhere. The only way to do this is if you get the training from the messenger, but still, it's not like you're imitating the messenger. You get the training from that, the answer comes with solution methodology, and resurrection is the best example for that reason. Uh, today, we were talking about uh, the proof of resurrection that Ibrahim a.s. was asking at the end of Surah Bakr. He has questions, and then he asks the question, the creator says, don't you believe? Then, no, no, he says, I believe, but to satiate my heart, to satisfy my heart, then comes with a uh, like experiment. He says, make, make this experiment, then you will find satisfaction. So it is teaching you how to do it, and then you do it, you experiment it. I mean, one way to take it is imitation, the other way to take it is experiment. If the creator says, do this experiment, then you will see that it works. He makes the experiment and it works. And now he's uh, was the verse and saying that Allah Aziz al Hakim, so then he sees the glory and the wisdom of the creator by repeating the experiment of sending the birds and then calling them back and the birds come. So I think Quran is, the revelation is teaching me how to make sense of this existence. But I, if I shut my doors to revelation and say that at the end of the day, I'm going to use my intellect and senses, why do I need that? If this is the tool to prove it, I can prove it anyways. But it doesn't work like this. This is my understanding. Suhail, I saw your hand up. Uh, make your comment. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I was similar to what Yusuf was going to say, but br uh, briefly, to defining imitation um, is important. And the way he uses it here is imitation as it pertains to um, one's inability to reason out something. So imitation fundamentally requires another party. So, you know, if I go to the masjid and I listen to somebody's sermon and they're telling me to believe in the resurrection, it was a, a common occurrence. Um, it may sound nice to me or acceptable to me. That sort of um, belief is particular to me. It's it's imitation in the sense that I'm just taking somebody else's, theoretically, somebody else's conclusion. Let's say the person saying that concluded that and taking, or if I read Nursi, I'm taking his conclusion and um, applying it to myself. One, on account of I trust the individual and two, because it sounds, it sort of resonates with me. You know, I don't want to go into non-existence. I don't want to fade into oblivion. And I want to be resurrected. You know, when somebody call, doesn't call that a belief, I'm, I'm a little bit less black and white on that because belief in terms of confirmation is, to me, has degree. So if somebody says that sounds right to me, to me, that's a sort of confirmation in a very sort of limited and particular sense of the individual. Pure imitation to me would be somebody says the resurrect, somebody says the resurrection, independent of what I think, I say there's resurrection. And nobody really thinks like that. I mean, if somebody says the resurrection, it sort of evokes a feeling within any individual. Um, where reason or how one sort of uses reason, and I think it ties to the seeing the names to the maximum degree, is if you are able to take what somebody informs you about, let's say there is something called a resurrection, and looking to the rest, not only, of, not, not only looking to yourself, but to the rest of the cosmos, it reason tries to encompass the totality of existence to come to a conclusion. It's not just particular to the self. You're not just looking inward, but you're also looking outward. 
and saying that, oh, definitely, not only is it sort of compatible with me, but it's compatible with the entirety of the nature of the universe, the nature of existence. It's completely, it is undeniable. Um, and that conclusion becomes absolutely certain for you because it's a universal conclusion. Whereas just sort of taking what somebody said, you court sort of maybe cut yourself off from the rest of the universe or your environment and those around you and saying that this thing is particular to me. Somebody says there's resurrection. This is kind of how I feel about it and how I take it. And so I'll take it to be true, um, which is why often sort of, I guess in sort of modern civilization, everybody says that everybody has their own belief and people have a, there's, there are the notion of relative truth or everybody has their own truth, whatever that means, um, is so in vogue. Uh, because people aren't able to use their reason universally. So it, I, you know, I won't, I won't say, and I don't even think Norsi's saying, maybe I'm wrong here, but I don't think he's saying imitation is, has nothing to do with belief. Because to me, that's sort of discounting using as Hatice Beza said, sort of your human expectations as a, as a means of confirmation but it's not universal. You can't see the names in, in, in this example of all, all powerful and giver of life universally to the maximum degree, which is the nature of prophecy. Um, so that's how, how I took it from this section. Thank you. Thank um, you. So just to add on to what's, been said already. Um, first, I want to actually address Aishina's point, which I think, um, thank you for bringing that up. It got me thinking um, about certain things. And I think it is important to make that distinction between a uh, belief that is imi imitative and belief that is confirmative. And I also say imitative belief, and I use the word belief there intentionally because the author makes such a distinction as well. So I'm just thinking about then what what do these terms connote? Um, and I also found the idea that, you know, checking something with my feelings, that being a part of the confirmative belief process. So um, then that goes into part of the process of confirmative belief. But then I was thinking, um, can there be any sort of imitation that is free from some sort of human feeling um, in and of itself? And then I was also thinking, just because imitation is imitation, again, does it render it empty of truth? So, for example, let us assume there's a farmer who sows his seeds a certain way and, I don't know, tills the land or whatever. There's a certain procedure that he follows and his crops seem to be doing well, and he has a son, and his son is simply mimicking, copying his father's way of life. He doesn't know why the crops grow the way they do. He doesn't understand, um, let's say, the order uh, within the universe. He's simply imitating his father uh, because he sees that his father seems to be benefiting from this particular act. So when the, when the boy... Boy, um, imitates his father, he may not have the same level of certainty or understanding or um, confirmation of reality of what is going on as his father, but he's still benefiting from the result of that. So maybe even a more um, simpler example, like two plus two equals four. And I don't know how to add. I don't have the concept of um, math, or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> A lot of people say that. Um, but yeah, like I don't, I don't, like let's say I don't know how to add things, but um, 
I take it that two plus two equals four, just because you say so. And although there is no reality in it for me, there's still reality in two plus two equals four. So there's still some sort of benefit I'm getting to, like that I'm receiving from it. But I, I do think going back to Aishina's point again, that she's highlighting something important here. And that's because of the fact that um, like the way that society today, namely the Muslim community and maybe all communities, we all suffer from this imitative belief. It's, it's like a widespread disease, right? Because of this particular reason, then I understand why it's important to make this very sharp distinction between what imitative means and what confirmative belief is. Um, but I think maybe just within the particular um, context of this text, within this particular group, within this particular discussion that we're having tonight with these people, between us maybe, I, I don't want to be one who necessarily <laughs> supports imitative belief, but I think given you know all these disclaimers, I, I mean, then I'm still trying to make sense of them what the author means that by, you know, um, the man of the night who has never seen the sun and has only seen its shadow in the mirror of the moon um, means them because they're like, it's not saying that it's seeing the shadow in the mirror of the moon, which looks essentially to the sun, right? So there, I mean, it's just very, very far away. It's like your cousins, 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 cousins. I don't know, whatever. I mean, that might just go back and forth. Cause, <laughs> but, um, basically, what I'm saying is there's a lot of veils in between, but there, there's got to be some sort of, like, you can't, at least I can't, um, disassociate the human feeling of something from a particular act of imitation, at least I think, as far as I, I'm trying to think of examples in my mind. So I might benefit from it, although I cannot confirm it, and maybe this should not be something that is said out loud, in the real world, um, but it's, I, I, I think there's still a fine point that's being highlighted here. So I don't know, I, I'm open to uh, any counter arguments. I'm, I would love to hear. And I think, Nirvana, do you have anything you wanna say? Okay, here you go. Well, okay, I wanna address the last thing you said, which is, um, it made me think of how, I think in, in like a lot of, children's development and developmental psychology. Uh, they look at how children basically start learning morally good behavior by imitating. Mm -hmm. um, but then at some point they do grasp some sort of like higher truth or abstraction about why it is good to be kind to someone or to be fair or to be just. But when they're first learning these things, um, we usually just make them like make it a force of habit first <laughs> and then kind of fill it in. Um, so maybe that goes to add to your point, but I think you're right to be wary about imitation because like the way you reasoned, right? Um, there's some truth in the number four that regardless of whether you understand it or not, how you got to number four it's still true um i feel more suspicious of that because it to me it feels like it's a slippery slope yeah. that you can kind of just be like well if at the end of the day i'm just going through the motions and i say all the right things then what's the point in filling in like the substance because there is some truth and maybe it's not it doesn't work when you're self-reflecting but if we're having a conversation about belief in general I think it is dangerous to think that way if I may just Go. add one thing <laughs> yeah I think I, I like as I was listening to I think it's like putting the cart before the horse like you've got the cart and the horse so it's not that there's no reality to the cart and the horse but you just got it kind of flipped and so it's not, I guess the point that I was trying to get to is like, you can't render it completely empty of any sort of reality, but at the same time, 
you can't say this is enough or sufficient or just by itself it's um um I see a hand, so I got distracted. Um, but yeah, by itself, that it's it's not um, enough. Okay, so I'm done. Do you have anything else? I, I mean, I think the idea is just that, like, someone who, someone can say there is a creator, or there, like, I, I have a creator, or some sort of like thing that we judge to be true. But if they themselves don't have any sort of personal tether to that statement what is that it means yeah. nothing in my opinion but I feel like maybe some people think that's like too harsh to say because for that person maybe it's like a starting point but I think I don't know. given, I think it given is, our context it's a little dangerous yeah, yeah. I agree. all right thank you I I have two questions one the first one is uh with an example, so Hatice Fereza is an artist, right? Like she's very talented about certain like certain stuff. She claims so. We haven't seen any. <laughs> I have seen. Oh, I really have so. seen some like some of her okay. works. <laughs> so like me watching her doing whatever she does and trying to imitate her, would that like just let let's forget about the religion, belief, and all that? Would that really make me Hatice Fereza? Or would that really make me as talented as she is? Is that like... Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. can, I, can you repeat your sentence again? Would that make you a what? I'm sorry. So like... <laughs> she, she wants to hear that. Like, <laughs> make it a lot. <laughs> me trying to imitate you with your art. Would that really make me you? Or like as talented as you are? <laughs> talented, she said. He said. <laughs> well, I would say... Um, if you haven't seen my art, how, how do you know I'm talented? Okay. That's not the point. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know if you still, it is still the same, but I have seen some of your uh, arts from your youth, like this, that way, when you were in high school. Wait, um, I can I just say, I'm not Hatija Beza, by the way. <laughs> um, there is actually, like um when people learn to play an instrument um you can either learn to just like let's say you're learning to play piano and you just learn one song and you don't know the notes you're playing you just know where to press when and at the end of that sort of practice you have memorized something and you can perform it in front of a bunch of people let's say but your knowledge is so superficial that if someone were to say, okay, now play it in D minor or play it at like, I don't know, two times the speed or slower or whatever, right? Like you would flounder. So I think imitation could get you to like a superficial level of um, manifestation, but because you lack the fundamental like building blocks of the thing that you're imitating, you it's so easy for you to lose it. You're saying that imitation is a part of like humans, like learning process. So Hatija Beza just said it can be. Um, I think so. that like, if we're just going by that piano example, the idea is that if you're learning piano properly, um, you would learn it with, if you, you would learn a piece by learning like everything that makes it that kind of, a piece and how you can play it in various ways and what kind of notes are important for it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't, I don't know if in that sort of learning that's going to stay with you and that's much more substantial. You're necessarily imitating. I think that's that's a different kind of process. Even though, let's say, the first time you learned it, you learned it by imitation, and then you realize you actually don't know anything, so you can go back and learn it more substantially, but. And then, uh, I'm so sorry to mom and Slade. We just keep intruding without <laughs> raising our hands. Actually, our hand is infinitely raised, it seems. So I don't know. If, anyways, um, I just wanted to say very quickly, like going back to Yusuf's point, like through imitation, it can still be a process of com confirmation. So the act of imitation in and of itself can be for me to test something. So in that case, would you say, is it still imitation? I don't know. You figure it out, but... <laughs> Um, I, I don't think, again, like it, it can be something that it's, it's there. 
it's not something I should just like cross out just because of what it is. Um, but again, I wouldn't say this in any other context. Yeah, yeah that, that was the first question. The second question is, uh, if I am imitating something, and that, if that actually really fulfills my needs or my expectations, why would I push myself like any further than that? What's the point? There is no point. That's my opinion. So then, then like, why would I even have like be part of this conversation? Whether what is imitation, what is not imitation, what's confirmation? Like, if I am already happy with that state, I am already happy with that state. So like, I don't know how this conversation, like, making the separation between like what's imitation, what's not. Like, I don't know how it would really add value. Like, on top of what I am already on, like, and how I feel about like everything around me. So, you're saying so like in other words, like why does it matter like to even like make that distinction? Like if imitation, whatever it like whatever I am imitating, like is already an answer for my like if there is any question for my questions or if or any kind of uh, concerns. So you're saying as long as I'm happy I'm content, and I, you don't care about this differentiation I mean, if, if it's belief or if it's imitation. Like, human being is very selfish, right? Like, and selfish in the, in the sense that, like, you go after pleasures or whatever you want to name it, like, and we want to enjoy the moment or the life. So if, uh, in that sense, like, if the alternative doesn't really, if I don't see any value, like that it's adding for that immediate expectation, then like, would I go after it? No, probably not. So why would I force myself to even like go through that process? Process of imitation? Or, or process confirmation. of imitation. confirmation? In other words, like in this specific co context, we are talking about the imi uh, believing, imitating the belief in afterlife. So like, one way or another, like whoever you like you talk to, like even the most atheist ones, they have at least some sort of hopes of like continuation of the life. Not like some sort of shape or forms. Like at least they have that hope that there might be a chance of afterlife. And if imitating that idea or there there is a possibility and if that satisfies the human needs, so like why would anyone really go after and Look for substantial proofs to like, to confirm that it really exists. What I would say is, because uh, your your contentment like sometimes crumbles, like something happens in your life, and you thought you believed in resurrection, or you okay, you believe that you're gonna somehow turn into something else after you die, but then something happens, or you're hit with something, and then this belief crumbles, it stops satisfying you. And now you need more, so you need to take another step. So you something pushes you. How I'd say, uh, Mamu Said has his hand up for a long time, so I'll, let, I'll give the word to him first. <clears throat> okay, salam alaikum. Uh, there was the question about this, uh, the legacy of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the uh, continuation of this paragraph, uh, the author, at the, the last, last sentence of this paragraph, the author brings um, this uh, day and night as the uh, uh, carrier of the message of the resurrection. Um, I think um, the... the um, when the message talks about resurrection as a human being, I uh, I don't observe as a resurrection of uh, of me after death. I haven't seen anybody who was um, who's resurrected after death. Um, that's why I think I need to be. Uh, um, or I need I need to have an evidence to believe in it, and um, 
so I think that's that's where the messenger is needed for me to uh, interpret this message that talks about day and night in the context of resurrection. I think it's not really easy that that uh, like as a as a assuming that there is no messenger but just the message. Um, you know, it's like it it is in front of me, but I don't know how to communicate with it. Let's say definitely in that in that case, when I see the day and night in a text, um, uh, it is kind of impossible for me to break my already established understanding of day and night and then read it as it refers to uh, to the qualities of its maker. Or it doesn't have to be a day and night. It can be the seed uh, dying and then a tree is coming out. How am I going to read it? Okay, it's something. It is something happening. But how am I going to interact with this in, uh, with this uh, with this event in a way that is going to tell me about its creator um, I think in this point I need a, a an educator to um, to show me how to read it and show me in a way that he is that 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 educator himself is being um, um, convinced and and um, and and the universe that he lives in that I live in can be interpreted can be interacted in a way that tells me about its creator right now it, at that point I need an educator if I do not um, if I don't uh, um, ask how to read these events in order to acknowledge its maker, then automatically I will find myself imitating. So imitation leaves this world here and now as it is, and not as a message, but as like happenings and it's, it was always like this and it is happening like day and night, it's happening. I have never seen a, 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 a period or a day in my life that there was no night. So I'm very much used to seeing it. It's, uh, and um, so if, I, if I'm not invited, if I'm not triggered to, in, uh, to interpret this event in order to acknowledge the qualities of its maker, um, I will not be able to do so if I do not attempt to interpret it to acknowledge its maker. I think their imitation becomes very comfortable and comfort zone because everything is happening as it, as they are, and then I, you know, I I say I believe in the resurrection, but my moment, the the night that I'm living in, doesn't tell me anything about its maker. So um, in this way, the, the, the necessity of an educator is not about really after death, but it's about the moment that I live in, because the moment that I live in, I am not able to interact with the night in order to acknowledge its maker. Um, so it, 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 something, it becomes something repetitive, right? Yeah, we. I always see it is happening. That's it. And yes, I believe in the resurrection too. So uh, imitation is uh, is a, in the, at this point, imitation becomes a matter of uh, living without meaning at this moment. No one wants to stay at this at that stage. Um, it was beautifully, I think, explained that maybe it is a starting point. It can be, but. I am sure no one wants to stay at that at that stage, too. Um, I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that was beautifully said. Uh, we have some comments. So H MB and HB, I think in reply to your second question, it says that they said some comments. Does it satisfy you fully, though? 
are really happy though. I'm guessing this is uh, talking about living with imitation. And they also said later, you don't need to force yourself and you shouldn't uh, to, I guess, try to start confirming things. If you don't feel the need, then you shouldn't force yourself. And then Suhail some, has some comments. Imitation in the context of this text is being unable to reason out the necessity of a thing. I think why Nursi brings up the resurrection is because this was a common supposition within Kalam that the resurrection cannot be proven, so therefore must be accepted because God and his prophet have testified to its existence. To be the Adam is to see reality as it is and being certain about the necessity of resurrection because you are experiencing it. However, the fact that man can reflect on, say, the resurrection implies he is not satisfied with simply imitation. The fact man can reflect on resurrection implies he is not satisfied with simply imitation. He says other comments. It is within man's very nature to be certain, and in certainty there is the highest level of satisfaction. Imitation is divorced from an individual's day-to-day -day life because he is not experiencing it, rather taking it for granted. Or as Nursi says, the resurrection is the manifestation of the greatest name, i.e. mercy, compassion, wisdom, justice, etc. Imitation does not consider the manifestation of names, in other words, the face of the universe, but instead considers only the conclusion at face value without thought or consideration. So along the same vein of what Muhammad, uh, Brother Muhammad Said said, uh, imitation is not, since Imitation kind of means you're not living every moment with meaning. Uh, it's not really something you want to stay in for long. Like it's something maybe you can go through, but you don't want to remain there because you want to be able to interact with things uh, in a meaningful and deep way. That is more than imitation. That's what I got from your comments. So Hale's last comment. Um, I think is it's, it's really insightful. In that, you know, when we, at least like, when I get into these conversations about imitation or confirmation or um, is it valuable or does it mean anything, it always seems a little bit externalized. Like, okay, this is this person, let's say, imitates something. And so, um, you know, uh, the value of their belief is this, right? I'm not saying that anyone says this, but, um, or this person confirms it, so their belief must be, you know, it's a strong hand. Like this sort of ex external evaluation or um, of, of what it brings to someone. But I, I feel like in this last comment, especially, in other words, the face, uh, but I said considers only the conclusion of face value without thought or consideration. Like at the end of the day, it's, it's about, what a certain conclusion brings to me or doesn't bring to me, right? It's about what it allows me to experience or doesn't let me experience. So, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying this for myself, you know, if, if I have imitative belief or whatever, it's not about, oh, either um, not having a certain capacity or, um, you know, like, saying it's not even about that it's about what am I depriving myself of because if I have the confirmation of something through sort of this reflection on on names of mercy compassion wisdom justice and through those names have this sort of confirmation of resurrection that just gives me so much more joy like just and pleasure and contentment and security in that belief, I guess. Like, it, it brings with it something. It's not something just about, like, this sort of, um, well, this is intellectually, look, I'm at this intellectual level or not. It's just about what it allows me to experience as a human being and the state of security and happiness. Um, and I guess what, in this sense, if I imitate or if I hold a belief that I haven't confirmed, it's, it's about what that imitative status deprives me of in terms of 
not being able to experience certain names or qualities that I have the potentiality to experience. Um, so I, I guess like, I, I don't know if I'm making much sense, but I guess at the end of the day, it's, it's about, um, and, and maybe this is like very obvious, but it's about what these beliefs or how I even come about to these beliefs, what they bring to me in terms of my state of being, my feelings, um, my emotions, and and just like the sheer joy aspect. I mean, I, of course, like as 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 HPs, I was saying, like even let's say if I don't reason at all or don't go through the names, um, I believe in resurrection. Yes, there will be a sense of like I guess um, security in that, like okay, like I want to believe in resurrection, so I'm going to believe in it. And yes, that conclusion or that belief itself will offer me something. But if I come to that, I conclusion through these qualities and names or the manifestation of these names, not only do I reap the benefit of what that belief entails, but also the sort of the process of engaging with those names and realizing them and being able to experience them in my now. Um, that in itself is a sort of separate so, happiness. Is it really possible for someone to be able to actually imitate someone someone else's conviction and at the same time be content and feel the same security i mean i, I like practice yeah, is I it mean, really possible I, like, I have no idea like i don't know you know <laughs> but i mean let's say let's talk about a grandma or something all right let's talk about my grandma i don't know like why she believes in resurrection but she does and she seems very happy about it no, she doesn't, like, have, no, no, she doesn't have like this sort of content issue of actually uh, let's not talk about others like like let's talk, talk yeah, about ourselves okay. so like when i ask the question to myself like, like you you can only ask that question of does it actually bring contentment if you're not really like for example you're actually you're, thinking you're, about it otherwise that question i don't know your, exist. Know your conviction uh -huh. about the afterlife yeah. <laughs> so like is it really possible for me to imitate your conviction and behave about myself at the same time? I don't know. You gotta ask that for yourself. When I ask the question, the answer is no. Yeah. So, like, if that is the case, then what's the point of even like having this conversation? For me, the answer is no. So, like, how this conversation is really benefiting me in this case? I mean, like, I guess all the people here, like. You surround to yourselves with like people seemingly from outside. They are very like certain about what they say or what they believe uh, at different ages, at different level of beliefs. Like, ask yourself: Do you really like see yourself? Like, let's say we are imitating certain people. Like, do we like enjoy the life or the see the life? The, the world like do we have the same kind of perspective about the experiences as those individuals look i think that in so much as this looks to me right because that is like uh, there is a question of what is at stake in having this conversation in terms of me in my life i am sure that i have both consciously and unconsciously a lot of beliefs that are imitative and some of them of which i know that i have them imitatively um if I don't think about it too much, I'm very content with them as well, you know? Um, like, it doesn't bring me much despair of like, oh, but I don't really know, I haven't come to God. I'm just like, yes, it's there. And I don't know if I've confirmed it, but I do, you know, it's there. Sure, would I like to have it? But I, what I'm saying is, what I was trying to say is, in that moment, it's not about confirming it so that I have this sort of intellectual grasp about it, it's that, if I haven't confirmed it through the qualities, through the manifestation of these names, I'm de there's something I'm depriving myself of. There is something there for me to enjoy and experience, but I'm depriving myself of it and just saying, well, this conclusion itself is nice too. I think that's that's a takeaway that I'm having here. So, so, so Helen made one comment saying certainty is personal. So most of time I feel like uh, regardless of the content like I am so liberal 
in use of language, in use of sharing my ideas. So oh, please, please feel free. Uh, but it, at the same time, I feel like sometimes, you know, I say things uh, without even asking what I mean. So we say, for instance, confirmation, I say confirmation, certainty, reasoning, coming to a conclusion. So just, you know, try to understand the text. Let's say this is our goal. Just trying to understand what he's saying. Isn't it interesting? He used this word imitation, not for the atom, who says, you know, I don't have anything. I'm just a transparent being. Everything is given to me. He's not using imitation for him. He's using imitation as a, the perfection that you can reach is the imitation, he says. For whom? Philosopher. Flower. Uh, in the metaphor, the, uh, the droplet, the philosopher, wise philosopher, he thinks, he reasons everything, he thinks, comes to conclusions about things, he thinks, you know, he uh, comes to a, a confirmation, he confirms things. He tried to find his way through his thinking, right? This is the droplet, the way he defines. But he says, if you take this path, let me read. Uh, but in conclusion and in submitting to the truth and confirming the reality, they're in agreement, just as a man of the night who has never seen the sun and has only seen its shadow in the mirror of the moon. Droplet, wise philosopher, cannot squeeze into his mind the resplendent, resplendent light and awesome gravity particular to the sun. If this is your path, I'm just using his words. Okay, and again, I'm trying to understand what he means. If you are advanced as far as the moon with the telescope of your droplet of your thought, and by the stairway of philosophy, you enter the moon, whatever. So if you are following this path, even if you try, he says, you cannot grasp, you cannot squeeze into your mind if you try to think about it, you will not be able to. Awesome gravity particular to the sun, but submits to those who have seen it and imitates them. So those who seen it, according to author, are the ones who leaves everything. Uh, this owner everything. They say, I have no idea. I don't, you know, I cannot think. It's given to me. I cannot feel it's given to me. These are the ones who seen sun, not the thinkers. And he says thinkers, not, you know, laymans or whatever, wise thinkers. When it comes to sun, when it comes to resurrection, don't cheat yourself. That I, oh, I understood this. Oh, I confirmed this, whatever. You have to imitate, he says. If this is what we mean by confirmation, so the question is then, what do we mean by confirmation or being convinced? If you are thinking about, you know, finding some evidence, uh, you know, make deduction, uh, induction, whatever, he was using such words at the beginning, istidlal, relying on belial evidence. I will see some evidence and then make some understand, like, uh, reasoning out of it. I will drive some equations or to do something, I don't know, depending on your talents, depending on your quote unquote, again, uh, your abilities. Because wise philosopher or wise thinker, 
would think it's his thought, right? That I will come to a conclusion. If this is your path, he says, what you're going to do when it comes to resurrection, don't cheat yourself. It's nothing but imitation. As for seeing sun, if you want to see it, be like the atom who disown everything, who doesn't think that he thinks of something. He doesn't think he came to a conclusion. So again, like I'm telling this, it's just you know, trying to understand the text, that it seems, at least within the context of Mursi's text, it seems it's not that easy to talk about, you know, confirmation, conviction, whatever, without asking ourselves, like, what I mean with this. Because if what we mean is even slightly close to this wise thinker, then he says, you will imitate. You might be wrong, like I'm not categorically into that whatever he says is right. He might be wrong, just trying to understand the text. But the imitation, he says, not for this layman who cannot think, who cannot whatever. Imitation is for the ones who try to solve everything through thinking. That's the point that they can reach when it comes to resurrection, when it comes to seeing the sun. So I think, again, within the context of this text, we have to rebalance these notions like Mm, what I mean with conviction, what I mean with uh, confirming. Oh, human cannot, you know, live without confirming. Uh, if I cannot reason, I'm just cheating myself, whatever. A wise philosopher would say the same thing. So, are you done? Yes. So what you said remind me of uh, what Eichner said and what I think also others have uh, implied or said that when you're living in this imitative state, it's a lot, and you don't see these names, uh, you lose a lot of meaning, or you're deprived of a lot. Like, I could say that this imitative state, the light you get is just whatever the moon can shine on you. It's a very small amount of light. However, if you were able to see the names, you were able to see the sun, that would be a great amount of light. So, uh, this approach, so here I can say like, there's like a comparison being made, like a relatively, Imitation compared to like true like seeing the sun, uh, imitation is like the moon. It can only be it only gives you a light as like strong as the moon. While if you're able to see those names like manifest in the greatest degree, then that gives you uh, a vibrance to your life. Like that's like the sun. Uh, that's how I can take it from now. Uh, brother, you should, yeah. uh, it will. I, mean, I guess just to conclude with some uh, repetitions, just in this context, within the text, yes, imitation is being used for philosophers, for those who uh, articulate, and that this is the best that they can do. And what sort of imitation they are doing, they are saying that, uh, as uh, Suhail very well say, they developed some sort of certainty to the speech of messenger, to the speech of God, but not specifically for resurrection, and they say, so it must be. This is the best that they can do. So there's no other way these guys can do with the tools that are that they take for granted. They, they limit initially, or I limit, I'm talking about them, I limit initially myself that I'm going to use these tools. And with these tools, the author is saying that at best, especially for resurrection, you can only do imitation. We cannot go beyond that. It's not possible with the tools that you have. This is like a description. It's not possible. That's it. But you will accept it how. It's not like, oh, I want it to be happen, so be it. No, no. You say that you will see it in the speech of uh, messenger and also the scripture. And you are convinced that these are providing a lot of truth. So you say that likewise you are trusting your mother you are saying that, okay, for the rest of the 30 years, here and there, everything was fine. For this one, I will go with it. You do this and you cannot do anything better in this context. This is what is being said in here. And uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this aspect of it in this discussion, but 
just to reiterate, I was reading Nursi as a uh, philosopher. What do I mean by that is, uh, this is a genius guy. He thought so deeply. He came up with these reasonings. And when I read it, it makes perfect sense. So I was thinking him as the source of this uh, reasoning. So what do I do? When I come across a new question, I am trying to build up my own way of reasoning. And to whatever extent I got lessons from him in terms of how to reason, it was getting me to somewhere. But Nursi tells me, if you are going to take me just as a philosopher, you can at most imitate certain things. Because you cannot, uh, I'm not the right person to take it exclusively, taking it from me only. Later on, what I'm realizing is, now reading Nursi in a different way than that I used to read, he is taking those uh, verses as like very point, pinpointing di directions. He goes and digs there and finds the treasure. He's not looking for, how can I, how can I come up with a uh, treasure detector? First, let me build up from my own knowledge a treasure <coughs> detector and then go and search for it in the whole area. And actually, uh, he gives a metaphor for that when he's interpreting the end of Fatiha. At the very end of the verse, he says, as if, uh, and in both, so he again makes three journey in that metaphor he uses. In, he is in one side of the mountain, and he is under the clouds and everything, so he is really in a very depressed mood and he said I should get to the other side of the mountain if I get to there I'm going to be happy in his first attempt he opens up a tunnel from under the mountain in his second attempt he goes from the surface of the mountain but there is storms and everything but he eventually reaches to the other side of the mountain in all these journeys in the third one he says I just cling to some verses. The verses take me like an elevator to above the clouds, and above the clouds are always sunny. Mm. So what I understand from that metaphor is, in the first two journeys, he simply take it as, uh, I need to put something from myself. I find it with my own faculties. In the third one, he says, I am needy, and I am provided guidance. What I'm supposed to do is to read this guidance, understand it and confirm it. Again, not imitation, confirmation, but it's not that I am going to come up with the solution myself. Because uh, this guy would know. So there is some, pro some problems. Finding the solution to problem is a big deal. It's not possible to do it in reasonable amount of time. But if somebody gives you the answer to that problem, you can, within a reasonable time, you can say that this answer is true. I think this is how we are as humans. From scratch, finding some solutions, especially to such hard problems like resurrection, is not humanly doable. This is my conclusion. And the evidence for that is humanity were not able to find answers for so many years to this question, if you would like to take it as an evidence. But on the other hand, if I am given an answer, I can confirm it in a reasonable amount of time. And this is what I'm in need of because I have limited life. I'm going to die. This is why I think in this context, the atom giving up everything is, it's giving up the notion, the understanding that I will correct this by myself. But rather saying that, no, I am in need of guidance. The tools are given to me with which I can only confirm. And I am open to this. Rather than saying that, no, I am going to clarify myself. I think this is the distinction of, at least in this context, philosophy versus the uh, legacy of messengerhood. Because messenger is aware that he is not able to crack those problems. Okay, he can understand this and that. 
maybe human can find the existence of a creator to some extent within his faculties. But it's just the beginning. It, it doesn't take you anywhere. It's just that much. There are tons of questions out there. How am I going to, okay, so there may be a God. There must be a God, but still, what does this mean? What does this existence mean? It doesn't answer any of those questions. And by myself, I'm not able to uh, come up saying, that, okay, this is what that flower means. This is what this uh, winds mean. Unless the author says that this is what I meant by them, check, see if it makes sense. Within the uh, completeness of the existence, this is what I mean by this sentence, this is what I mean by that chapter, and everything. This is why I, I am in need of, if I'm aware of that, I am in need of guidance from my maker, and then this is the part that I'm giving up. To me, it's very hard to give up, because I have this ego to say that, no, I know. But in the second case, I'm not saying I know. Actually, I'm saying that I do not know, as the messenger himself was saying in the cave. So he was taught. If, if I am able to say that I do not know, how am I going to know? Then I'm going to be start to be taught. Otherwise, at most, I can get to the moon. I can, uh, in the moon, even if I reach there, become the best of the philosophers, meaning that I'm not going to look at the uh, revelation. I can, at best, imitate certain things. I cannot do anything better than that because I don't have the means to do it. And I think the other side of the discussion which was taking place about uh, imitation, is it okay or not okay? I agree that generally this is being understood as for judging third person people. So this is why it's becoming uh, like unpleasant as uh, I sure was suggesting Osman I was saying, if I take it for myself, then yeah, it's a discussion for myself anyways. So I guess this is where the sensitivity is arising because when we make such a judgment, uh, it feels like we are judging a third person. And in reality, this is how I am feeling about it. I am judging third people in my personal world. Maybe uh, you guys don't, but I do. So uh, this is why I think it's, there is not much of a uh, value or fruitfulness, at least, for defining what's imitation, what's not imitation, in that sense of the word. But otherwise, in here, it's being uh, talked about something else. I'm gonna ask a quick question. Uh, right now, I'm getting like scared to think. Let's say uh, using like just sitting down and thinking about things. I'm just like, am I being a philosopher? Am I like looking at the moon? Like uh, when it comes to reflecting, even like reflecting on the universe, reflecting on Quran. Like, how are we supposed to reflect so that this is not uh, going into thinking? Then, like the wrong way of thinking. So, to the best of my understanding. If I'm not going, I will not be able to go any further, I will already know that there is something wrong with this line of thoughts because I, I'm not able to go further. This is where I will say I am now in need of guidance. I need to be admitting my inability. I can be saying, no, 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 I'm not accepting this failure. Rather, I can admit my inability and turn to revelation. Still, revelation is going to teach me how to reason. It's not that I'm not going to reason. Revelation is teaching me reason. Nursi is reasoning better than anyone that I have seen so far, but apparently he learned how to reason from revelation. I guess this is the part, from whom am I going to learn revelation? And in my ego, towards whom I have a tendency to knock their door and tell them that, okay, teach me. Am I knocking the door of my creator and saying that, alas, I cannot do anything. You are the knowledgeable one as we are saying at the end of the discussion, if I am truly able to say that, then this should lead me to uh, knocking the door of revelation and the messenger and the legacy of messenger, his students, to say that, then teach me from Quran. But still, when I'm going to read uh, several uh, studies of scholars, I will find bits and pieces in which I would say, that, okay, this guy is influenced by that. This doesn't really fit with revelation. 
it does have such things really happen. It's not like there are like clearly written, okay, this guy is the ideal scholar, this is not ideal scholar. Still, there are things on your shoulder, my shoulder. But I guess the basic question, the fundamental question is, am I in such a search? Because I find myself to be inclined more towards fancy, uh, let's say, Western philosophers, talking about myself truly, not anybody else. Because it looks like they invented uh, the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. They must have a more to say mm -hmm. in anything about intellectual reasoning or anything, or trying to prove anything. Mm -hmm. They should be the address, not like 14 centuries ago, a uh, man of a desert where I am. And I think this is uh, in the second one, because in the third one, he's going to take us to narrations of the messenger. Why? Because automatically the next thing that comes is, from there I'm going to learn this. Am I going to learn it from those narrations, which doesn't really uh, line up? Because it's a very serious, uh, what's it, excuse to say that, okay, you tell me not to take those philosophers, and you tell me to take those hadith or uh, narrations, which is a lot mixed. How am I going to make sense of that? I guess this is where he is carrying us to. How am I going to make sense of it? Still, it's a legitimate question. I mean, this excuse is a legitimate excuse, but not to reject using those resources. So in, this is why in the second, he is putting a ground for why shall I be searching truth in the line of messengerhood rather than in the line of philosophy or uh, like personal I don't know, development sort of things? Thank you. We have a, we're actually out of time. I'm going to read Sir Hill's comment. Seeing the moon is seeing a dim reflection of the light, whereas seeing the sun is seeing the light directly. In other words, taking resurrection for granted versus bearing witness to it within your own and universal reality because you experience it with all your human faculties. In other words, taking resurrection for granted, which is we're seeing the dim reflection of the light, versus bearing witness to it with your own and universal reality because you experience it with all your human faculties. No, these are theoretical distinctions. Individuals cannot be so easily divided into those who imitate and those who are certain. This text to me is more so personal advice to pay attention to the manifestation of the names. For as Aishanur says, there is a maximum satisfaction in this that imitation cannot provide, and I am personally desirous of absolute and eternal satisfaction. <laughs>